Good day. Welcome to the Green Left Show. I'm Alex Bainbridge. I'm here today with David Mejia Canales. He's a senior lawyer with the Human Rights Legal Centre. The Human Rights Legal Centre has recently produced a report called Protest in Peril, Our Shrinking uh, Democracy. And it documents 20 years of attacks on protest rights in this country, which now mean that uh, protesters potentially face tens of thousands of dollars of fines and, and actual imprisonment. Uh, for simply exercising the rights to peaceful protest. Before we do get underway, I want to acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you from stolen Jagera Turbul country, and all around this land, the, the land is stolen, unceded land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Also at the beginning, if you do like the work that we produce, uh, please become a Green F supporter if you're not already. Plans start from just $5 a month, and you can find information at the Green F website or uh, in the link with um, this uh, with this video or podcast. Now, protests under peril. The Human Rights Legal Centre has recently released this report. In the forward to the report, two knitting nanas write this. Protest works to create a better future for all of us, but the right to protest is under attack. We were both arrested when we took part in a series of actions with Blockade Australia at Port Botany in March 2022. We are knitting nanas. Our motto is, quote, saving land, air and water for the kiddies. Our yellow nana t-shirt states that, quote, well-behaved women seldom make history. And this has certainly proven over the years in Australia and globally. Women didn't get the vote by asking nicely. They had to take bold action to demand their rights. They conclude, the rights to freedom of expression has always been important, but now it is a question of life and death. There are many amongst us who are unable to protest, so we feel a responsibility as older women, mothers, grandmothers, and wildlife carers to do everything we can to protect all life. And indeed, protesting is important for many reasons. To stop this genocide in Gaza, to save humanity from an existential climate crisis, and even for simple things like to, to stop an unfair eviction or to stop someone from unfairly being fired from their job. There are many reasons why protest is important. So uh, thanks for joining us, David. Uh, I'd, I'm wondering if we can get underway. Can you just please lay out the case that you make in this report, Protest in Peril? Sure. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for, for chatting with me. Um, in the report, what we've done is we've analysed uh, protest, well, laws that actually impact our ability to gather together. So they're not all necessarily protest laws speaking, but really laws that are, that are impacting our right to freedom of assembly. And we've analysed them uh, compared to say, you know, can these laws impact people's ability to take to the streets or protest in any way? And what we found is we found that there are 49 laws that have been introduced around the country in the last 20 years. That's more than two a year, which is really very alarming. Thankfully, they did not all pass, but every single one of them did harm because of the narrative uh, about protesters that, that these laws sort of assumed, uh, that people were protesting are vandals, that they're obstructing, that they're dangerous. Um, so what we're finding, though, is that because of these narratives, this eroding narrative about protest and the, the many, many benefits that peaceful protest has given us all here in Australia, um, because the narrative is eroding, these laws are becoming easier to introduce. Finally, I think the other thing I'll add is that um, many of the offences that, that these laws do have in them are very, very vague, vague and incredibly broad. And they also have unbelievable uh, punishments. So say, for example, obstructing a public space, which could be anything from a bench to a doorway to a hall to a stadium in South Australia can land you up with a, with a fine of up to $50,000, even if it's only for a couple of minutes. So that's a defining feature of these laws is that the, the offences are vague, the penalties are severe, and it is happening uh, all over the country, not evenly, but it is happening everywhere. So what do you see as the biggest threats to protest rights in Australia at the moment? Yeah, look, I think the, the biggest, um, I suppose in many ways, one of the things that, that is sort of facilitating these laws being passed is the fact that not all jurisdictions in Australia have a Human Rights Act. So uh, the Human Rights Act exists in the ACT, in Queensland and in Victoria. That's not to say that these places have perfect protest regimes by far. But what happens with the Human Rights Act is that the Human Rights Act forces parliaments to consider the human rights impacts of every legislation. It also makes courts um, basically interpret the law with a view to human rights and it makes sure that public authorities make decisions considering human rights. If you look at the example in South Australia, the law passed the lower house there in under 20 minutes, which, you know, is not even enough time to do a lot of washing. 
Whereas a similar law in Victoria had to go through a considered process, um, which, and the end result is that the laws in Victoria are still bad, but they're a lot more targeted to either specific places or specific behaviour. In South Australia, they apply to everyone, everywhere, at all times, without exception. So the, the, the biggest, I suppose, the, the lack of a Human Rights Act is one of the biggest sort of threats to our right to protest because it means that these laws can have really obscene penalties. They can be rammed through Parliament in places that don't have a Human Rights Act, and that leaves every single one of us worse off. And, and what would you say about states that already do have a Human Rights Act? Yeah, look, I've, you know, I really wanted to reiterate that just because a, a state has a Human Rights Act doesn't mean that they're very good. But what, what we are seeing, though, um, is that in states that do have a Human Rights Act, in some states it's quite a recent thing. Queensland is just a couple of years. Victoria has, has had about 10 years or so, and the ACT had the first one is that um, the problem there is getting public authorities to really understand their human rights implications, in particular the police. So often uh, many of these laws, regardless whether they happen in a, in a jurisdiction that has a Human Rights Act or not, they give police unbelievable powers on the ground. And what we're finding across the board, Human Rights Act or not, is that often police services are not properly considering the human rights of people protesting and they often don't see their role as protecting protests and protesters, but rather protecting the public from them. Uh, and that is a cultural shift that must happen. It is a non-negotiable. Can you talk about what happens after these laws get passed, including the potential for the policing of these laws to be even more draconian than what Parliament's intended? Yeah, oh, look, absolutely. So because, you know, give you an example, in New South Wales, the maximum penalty there is $22,000 from memory and, and quite a very significant jail time. That actually gives police incredible amount of power on the ground to either use these quite very, very vague charges to, to charge people with uh, and threaten them with quite severe penalties. Um, so so that we know that that is absolutely happening. What is also happening is that police are using bail, so often because folks um, are subject to quite a lengthy term of imprisonment in some instances, or they can be, um, police are using police bail uh, and, and just really very draconian bail conditions to split up protest movements. So you have uh, conditions like you cannot associate with anyone else from your organisation, for example. Uh, I've seen other conditions where the condition is you are not allowed to protest anything at any time, which in and of itself is probably unconstitutional. Um, or you'll have, um, you'll have uh, bail conditions that effectively put people under house arrest. And that is not the purpose of bail. Bail is just to make sure that you're going to come back to court. It's not a punitive measure. So it's not just uh, the police on the ground, which um, I would argue that, that a lot of them do not understand their human rights obligations. Even in jurisdictions that don't have a Human Rights Act, um, Australia still has human rights obligations that must be upheld, Human Rights Act or not. Um, but also afterwards, so during the process. So once someone is, say, charged or booked, uh, they might get some really draconian bail conditions that are punitive. Um, often this involves police harassment. So I've known uh, many a protester and activist, climate defenders, Aboriginal folks that have police turning up to their door at all hours of the early morning at night just to do bail checks for people who are not a risk. Um, so the, the policing is, is a big factor here. And, and what we're seeing, and, and, and maybe also my fear, is that maybe parliaments have exhausted what they can do with the law and they're relying a lot on police power and procedure to effectively um, deal with protests. We're definitely seeing this in Western Australia, where you, you know, even have counter-terrorism police, um, you know, targeting a climate defender group. And, and that is not just an obscene waste of resources, but it's an incredibly heavy-handed approach to people who are just protesting for climate change. Like in this country, it's easier for you to be locked up because you're protesting climate change than it is to have accountability for those who are causing the disaster in the first place. So what needs to be done to protect protest rights? Yeah, look, I mean, by all means, we need a Human Rights Act uh, at the federal level and at every jurisdiction doesn't have it. We also need to have comprehensive human rights education. And that's not just for the people who are making the decisions of public authorities, but also for every single one of us. We all need to understand that these rights belong to us. They cannot be removed. Uh, in a way that is not compatible with the law. 
So, you know, in terms of the legal framework, that's something that we are absolutely advocating for. And the report recommends that if the laws that are not compatible with our human rights obligations, if they cannot be amended, then they must be repealed and there must be a human rights act everywhere. That must follow where we, you know, we have to have um, solid um, human rights education. But I think another thing is that we also need to always be vigilant and fight back against anything that tries to demonize peaceful assembly. Because that is not just an attack on the people who are protesting. It's not just an attack on their causes, whether we like them or not. As long as it's peaceful, it's protected. But um, but this sort of narrative that you know we've forgotten that the eight-hour workday, land rights for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, as far as they are today, um, votes for women, votes for people who don't own land in general. These things were not given to us as gifts by parliament or politicians. They were fought for through protest. So we also need, um, we need to fight back against any narrative that demonizes our achievements through protest, because these narratives always come from people who we are trying to hold accountable. So we should keep that in mind. It's always those who we are trying to hold accountable that are the ones that um, repress our protests the most. How would you respond to somebody who says, I don't care what the government needs to do, I just don't want to be blocked in traffic when I'm late for work. I'm, I'm really sympathetic to that view. I mean, I think um, in many ways the right to protest involves a certain element of disruption, uh, whether it's a single person handing out a flyer in a footpath or whether it's a big congregation of people, just like we've seen recently uh, for peace, you know, in Palestine or the Iraq war before that, the war in Vietnam before that, you know, apartheid in South Australia before that. Um, Protest does have an element of temporary disruption. And we should all, as people who value living in a democracy, we should have a little bit of tolerance uh, for temporary disruption to our everyday life if our right to protest is going to have its full value. If a protest becomes so disruptive that it really brings some of those systems that we rely on to a standstill, the law provides a mechanism to deal with that. But it should always be a targeted um, intervention on the right to protest that is you know basically trying to solve a pressing social need it has to be justifiable in a democratic society and it has to be proportionate we are not seeing any of that so i have sympathy to the view of course we all have the right to freedom of movement but so do protesters so i'm coming at this from the activist from an activist background and speaking personally i think this is true for activists in general i mean i am very appreciative of the legal supports that i've got from lawyers in the past uh, at the same time, I'm, I've always been of the view that in order to defend protest rights, and in fact, democratic rights more generally, we need to exercise those protest rights. It is actually on the ground in protesting, is, that is the means by which we defend protest rights. So I'm wondering if you could talk about perhaps this interplay, because there is an interplay between the legal action, both at the legislative level and in the courts, legal action on the one hand and participating in protest on the other. Can you comment on that? Yeah, of course. Look, in many ways, um, I think I, I view protest as a bit of a gateway human right, because protest is how we've actually secured and expanded the human rights that we have. Um, that that is ha that happens through protest, uh, in, and that looks in many that looks very different in in many different ways that you can protest. Whether it's it's quite literally signing a petition or you have folks who will uh, lock themselves onto machinery, for example. It's a full spectrum. I think that we can never take for granted what we have achieved together because protest is, is our collective power. Um, and it's actually how we demand change, but it's also how we mourn, you know, through vigils. It's how we celebrate through parades and processions and indeed football matches. Like that's a peaceful assembly. So I think, um, I think we need to also start reclaiming back some of that narrative, that protest is, is for agitating for something that we don't believe in or we don't like. Protest is a fundamental feature of a democracy, particularly our democratic, uh, responsible and representative democracy. And we should embrace that. And I think that is how we actually start fighting back towards some of these narratives. But we all have participated in a peaceful assembly at some point it's sometimes, often many times, you know, in the one day. Um, so we, we need to start reclaiming some of that, I think, because, um, because it is powerful. That's why we're, we're seeing so much repression. If it wasn't working, we wouldn't see 49 laws in the last 20 years. Can you comment on this question of the right to protest, but in the broader context of attacks on democratic rights? 
And I'm thinking about, in particular, the anti-terror laws, but there's actually quite a number of attacks on democratic rights more broadly, and these attack on protest rights comes in that context. Can you comment on that? Yeah, of course. Look, I think um, the law's really clear uh, with regards to, say, um, what is allowed or what can be banned during a protest. Um, and, and because the right to protest is so fundamental in international law, it's a very narrow limitation. So the right to protest can be banned uh, or can be limited rather if it is being used as a propaganda for war. I think we can all agree that's probably a good thing. Uh, and for good reason. I mean, this, this, this sort of came out of World War II and you know, propaganda rallies and so on um, that had led to some terrible atrocities. But the same uh, for, you know, the, the right to protest can be limited if it's being used to incite violence or national racial hatred and all these sorts of things. So the bar is very, very high. Uh, for when you can start implementing those limitations. But what we're seeing at the moment is that any level of disruption, I mean, the Prime Minister said that someone unfurling a banner in Parliament House of all places was, not a, viol was a violent protest, and that it does not meet that definition at law. So often when, and this is actually mainly coming from politicians and then platformed in the media and then politicians again, so it's a suspicious cycle um, of this complete misunderstanding of how the limitation on the right to protest must be applied if it is required. So it is a, you know, it's a big question, um, but I think that we need to, it goes back to fighting back against those narratives. Because once we start um, sort of banning protests based on something that we may not agree with, or based on a topic that is perfectly lawful, but we might have a different view, we've actually already started going down a slippery slope that we do not want to be in. Um, so, you know, we, we need to understand, we need to have really good um, understanding of how the limitations can be applied to what and by who, and that is absolutely not happening at the moment, particularly from those in power, which is really, really concerning. Is there anything else you want to add before we finish up? Yeah, look, I think I think on the point about disruption, uh, whereas, you know, particularly um, in the last five to maybe seven years, a lot of the laws that have been introduced have been introduced because of the more high profile, borderline disruptive protest of for uh, climate action. It's almost exclusively climate activists, environmental defenders and animal rights protesters. And I really want to reiterate that if our right to protest is going to have any value, we, as, as people who, who value living in a democratic society where we can speak up, it needs to have an element of disruption that is temporary for that, for that right to work. So anytime a, a politician or a policymaker tries to tell us that um, we need saving from disruption, um, what they're actually saying is that they don't like that there's too much democracy. Well, uh, thank you very much for that, David. Thank you for your time. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Alex. Um, thank you. That was David Mejia Canales. He's a senior lawyer with the Human Rights Legal Centre. Uh, this is, we've been discussing the Protests in Peril report, and you can find that report on the, on the website of the Human Rights Legal Centre. Uh, thank you to you for joining us today. Uh, your, your support makes all the difference. And as I said at the beginning, please become a Greenft supporter if you're not already. Plans start from just $5 a month, and it is the number one way that we keep the wheels running here at Greenleft. Uh, also, you can support us on Patreon if that's more to your taste. And also, as I said, just without, without spending a cent, you can help us out by giving this video or podcast a thumbs up or a five-star review. Uh, spread the word. Uh, share this video or podcast with your friends. Help us build the audience. This issue, protest, right, protest rights, are very important. And uh, we, you know, it, it's actually very critical that we do uh, continue to defend the right to protest. Uh, every week in many places there are pro-Palestine pro rallies happening and there are climate actions, there are lots of actions happening around the place. Uh, please uh, join us on the streets uh, to defend our protest rights in practice and also to actually win the uh, reforms and improvements and structural change that we need. And uh, if we don't see you on the streets, we'll see you next time on The Green Left Show.